Okay. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to people from various countries. It's our pleasure to invite uh, two speakers in this session, Professor Constantine Lurie and uh, Professor Graham Milton. And Professor Constantine Lurie was born in Leningrad, US. After graduation and initial uh, spending some time in USSR, he moved to USA in 1989, where he was a Global Professor in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, MI. And since 1989 until now, he's serving as Professor of Mathematics in Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Professor Lurie is an author of fundamental papers in material optimization. He discovered the contradiction in a standard statement of material optimization in statics with the smooth interfaces between constitutive materials. This finding has opened the way for use composite uh, as necessary components in the optimal material assemblies. The analytical work with the composites has become possible after Professor Lurie with colleagues had produced a special technique making the optimization problem well posed. At the end of the 90s, Professor Lurie moved to the study of material optimization in dynamics with the use of substances that have their material properties variable in space and time. The progress has been connected with the appearance of a novel notion of a dynamic material, defined as an inseparable union of material and fluxes of mass, momentum, and energy connecting it with the environment. This concept appeared to be quite universal, embracing dissimilar applications among um, those mentioned in the talk. Professor Lurie is uh, the author of four books and a large number of more than 100 journal publications. Professor Luri, welcome to this uh, conference. You may begin now your lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Nandi Kumaran, for your generous introduction. And um, I regret to begin with the sad news today. Two weeks ago, on the 3rd of November, there passed away Professor Ilya Israelovich Blechman, a worldwide famous scholar in the field of applied mathematics and mechanics, the founder of a new chapter in mechanics named Vibrational Mechanics or Vibrational Dynamics, which is con conceptually <clears throat> quite close to what we are discussing at this meeting. He was more than just a scholar. He was a prophet who had foreseen new trends and designed many practically important mechanisms based on novel physical principles. To me, that is a great personal loss. We have been very close professionally and personally for many, many decades. I wish to dedicate this presentation to the memory of my dear and unforgettable friend. So this talk will be about material optimization and the concept of dynamic material that is closely connected to material optimization topic. Uh, a rational material design has been challenging people's curiosity since time immemorial. For millennia, it has been an art. And only recently, since mid 20th century, it began to be transformed into science named optimal material design. Optimal material design. And here is a slide that briefly characterizes this topic. It is, uh, the optimal material design is uh, the means to find material layouts that are called optimal if they lay of the, if these layouts mobilize resources hidden in material geometry to minimize the cost functional. And the main mechanism towards making this happen, I mean, making happen the uh, discovery of the uh, relevant material layout 
The main mechanism toward that is focusing of physical fields produced by optimal material layout. Optimal material design <clears throat> has started from the study of static heterogeneous formations distributed in space alone. And only very recently, some 20 plus years ago, it has been realized that some of its principles, some of its principles can be extended to material dynamics. In a wider context, <clears throat> Such extension requires a revision of a general outlook to material structures assembled in space and time from the original constituents that themselves demonstrate space and time dependent properties. These formations have been named dynamic materials. They are characterized in the following slide On the following slide. A special temporal material structures with constituent materials distributed in space and time. Primarily, dynamic materials defined, as I just pronounced, <clears throat> were um, related to material concepts to material uh, was was uh, understood as material concepts. In other words, the participants in material in dynamic materials were real materials, what we conventionally call materials. But in a broader sense, it can be thought of as environmental concept. For example, the road with the traffic, when the road is equipped with appropriately uh, located and probably brought to motion the road signs and uh, um, uh, um, uh, road signals may be treated as special temporal material system that demonstrate properties that are typical for dynamic materials. So both cases, purely material case and a broader case, are characterized by the change of material properties in space and time. For example, for the example with the traffic on the road, material properties will be the way the traffic signals and traffic signs are distributed down the lane that is occupied by moving vehicles. This definition this definition as of dynamic materials um, evidently extends our understanding of what is a material in general, or what is a material in general. Um, I will mention a property of dynamic materials that is very substantial. And that makes it specifically different from conventional materials. So when we, it comes to dynamic materials, material property patterns may be assembled on any scale, including micro and nanoscale. An example of dynamic materials, uh, examples of dynamic materials are very diverse, very diversified. The uh, uh, technological example, a very simple one, is a flying rocket. It is a system that demonstrates both stiffness and inertia properties that are space and time dependent. Space dependent along the rocket and time dependent through the rocket flight. Another example, property patterns in electrical networks. I will show you a couple of examples later dialectic and conducting media. One more example, traffic flow that have been, has been already mentioned. And the most remarkable examples offered by mother nature is living tissue. Living tissue as a specific dynamic material, the properties of which depend on space and time 
as we well know. What is common to all those examples and what makes dynamic material an entity that is conceptually different from conventional material is the existence of non-stop exchange of mass, momentum and energy with the environment. In, with the environment. So dynamic materials are originally defined as thermodynamically open systems. They stay in non-stop exchange of mass, mass, momentum and energy with the surroundings. And what we should really call a dynamic materials is inseparable union of material framework and these fluxes that control the exchange that I mentioned before. It is two, these two entities are coming in inseparable union, in inseparable union. Now, an example of dynamic materials given by technology, maybe either electromagnetic, it may be mimicked as it may be reproduced, illustrated in direct format as a transmission line with the uh, linear uh, inductance and capacitance that are tuned up, able to be tuned up. For example, here we have two cells of this direct, of this uh, discrete representation. The first cell with parameters 90 microhenry and 10 nan 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 nanofarads um, and 180 microhenry and 20 nanofarads. So the material properties are changing. And as we go to continuous description, we'll arrive at the transmission line with linear parameters, such epsilon and mu dependent on space and time. Analogous um, mechanical uh, format for transmission line is uh, um, built from mechanical elements with uh, uh, changing um, um, inertia parameters and changing uh, stiffnesses. Stiffnesses. I'm, knowing, I'm not going to dwell upon this construction. It is a construction of uh, uh, defined as an array of rocking disks the inertial moments of which can be uh, changed as we operate two uh, springs here that separate two connected masses. And also the uh, stiffness connection is also subjected to control, to control. So that brings us to mechanical analog of transmission line with variable parameters, variable in space and time. The key idea of a dynamic material as an inseparable union of uh, material motion of material um, uh, and um, uh, fluxes that constitute the exchange that uh, are responsible for the exchange between the material and the environment this uh, key idea ascends to the Noether theorem in the calculus of variations about the systems with Hamiltonian that depends explicitly on time and therefore violates the conservation of energy. This violation is accompanied by the energy flux into or away from the framework. One may say, for example, that the flux is supplied by an external agent committing work at the instance of material property switch. As far as the example of living tissue is concerned, we may, may say that this external agent represents the chemical energy that is stored in our cells. And once we move our arm, say, we release this energy to produce work that is responsible for changing material properties of our arm. The muscular, the muscles becomes uh, stiff, become more um, 
resistive and uh, the um, uh, stiffness also increases due to the use of this released energy. This is typical for dynamic material. This is typical for dynamic material. Now, um, as we introduce the external uh, agent, we have to realize the external agent is inseparable from the entity that we call uh, dynamic material, making this entity thermodynamically open. The analogy with the Noether theorem and dynamic material is very fruitful. The existence of fluxes may be due to two independent factors. The first factor is material motion or framework itself. And the second factor, independent of the first, is the motion of its property pattern. Each factor makes the Hamiltonian explicitly time dependent and produces specific, specific, special effects such as Fresnel drag in space-time modulated medium. This had been found some 20 plus years ago um, in uh, joint publications of my colleagues, Suzanne Weeks, Dan Onofre, and myself, but has surprisingly been overlooked and rediscovered by a group of authors, uh, Huidborough, Gillespie, Giorno, Cruster, and Pendry, in their recent open um, uh, in the, the recent paper published in October 2019, with no reference to our earlier work. This also has found surprising the appearance of Fresnel drag due to the moving pattern alone, with the framework remaining immovable. This overlook is a result of their under-evaluation of the specific of dynamic materials as inseparable union of the framework plus fluxes, which seems to be due to their insufficient acquaintance with the literature. Now we go to mathematical description and classification of dynamic materials. Uh, many dynamic materials appear through the analysis of linear wave equations with coefficients variable in, in space and time. In space and time. Uh, let me give you an example. Here we go. This is a wave equation and the coefficient epsilon and mu, it's electromagnetic context epsilon being dielectric constant and mu uh, magnetic permeability with coefficients that are space and time dependent. I am considering here one dimension in space and time as independent variables. And we will assume in the future that these coefficients epsilon and mu may take at each point in space time one out of two pairs of values, epsilon one mu one, we will call that material one. And similarly, the same symbol with indices two called as material two. Now, let's go to the next slide in which we, instead of epsilon and mu, introduce equivalent couple of parameters one of them defining the phase velocity in the medium with properties epsilon and mu, another defining the wave impedance of the same medium with the same symbols, uh, epsilon and mu. And now, as a prototype of the first order, the previous discussion was related to the second order, wave equation we may consider um, an evolution equation of the first order, actually continuity equation, that is um, um, uh, describing the road flag, uh, road traffic, 
we will give a more detailed description later on. Uh, but the best embodiment for the concept of dynamic materials is probably found in the formulation of Maxwell Minkowski electrodynamics, intensive formulation of it. Maxwell electrodynamics deals with two electromagnetic tensors, as we know, the tensor F uppercase and the tensor F lowercase. They are both called six vectors in some texts, such as electrodynamics by Sommerfeld. F is defined by the electromagnetic in, uh, magnetic inductance B and electric field E, and F is defined by uh, magnetic field H and um, 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 electric displacement D. So these tensors appear to be second rank tensors in full space of Minkowski. Uh, once we treat tensors of second rank composed of the unit vectors of four dimensional coordinates of frame as elementary elements. So with respect to the space in which elementary elements are these three, six uh, independent uh, tensors that form a basis in the six, six dimensions, uh, we will, we will conduct, we will uh, build the uh, electromagnetic tensors F uh, um, and F lowercase. Um, now, this is a system of Maxwell's equations, but we know that electrodynamics becomes complete once we complement uh, Maxwell's equations with material equations. And material equations, in the case of a dialectic material that is assumed to be conceptually is isotropic in standard format isotropic will be given as a second rank tensor composed of second uh, of uh, space time anti-symmetric a with double indices and uh, the uh, mm, structure of material tensor S introduces two eigenvalues, let's call them epsilon and mu, forget this uh, factor C, which is the uh, light velocity in the vacuum. So these are eigenvalues and here are combinations of eigentensors of A with double indices. Now, this is what is related to conventional isotropic dialectic. It is isotropic because it is, it is characterized by two uh, material constants, epsilon and mu. But it is isotropic with respect to conventional rotation only in the uh, as we apply the Galilean group of rotation or Lorentz group in which we apply only spatial rotation, then these factors are not affected and we deal with the eigenvalues alone. If we apply rotation in space time, in space time, that is material motion in space time, it is uh, qualified uh, as a rotation space time by uh, imaginary angle, then both uh, factors, this one, this one, and this one, and that one will be affected. And uh, we will arrive at what we call uh, dynamic material. Dynamic material will allow for both material motion and material properties be changed independently, be changed independently. Um, and now, uh, 
given this representational material tensor, it will be appropriate to give a natural classification of dynamic materials. Classification is based on the following easy observation. In the formula for S material tensor given above, there were two types of factors, one of them epsilon mu and another the combination of dyadics. Dyadics are responsible for material motion, whereas epsilon and mu are responsible for material property pattern. So assume that material property pattern is time dependent. In other words, we have a material in which we change only material pattern and there is no material motion in conventional sense. Then we call this material activated. This is a group of activated dynamic material. Another group is dual to the group of activated in a sense. In this one, we did epsilon and mu as time and space independent, whereas dynamic, whereas dyadics A or uh, eigen, eigen tensors A, I, K are allowed to demonstrate time dependence. And that means that our material is allowed to be involved in material motion. So we have two types of dynamic materials. We have two types of dynamic materials. Now in the following we will distinguish between uh, two types of dynamic materials that are defined differently. That, why, that will be defined differently. There will be another classification of dynamic materials that we will uh, di discuss, that we will discuss. But before we go to that, um, um, let's go back to the material description material uh, to the mathematical description of dynamic materials in the context of uh, uh, wave equations in the context of wave equations we know that for wave equations we have to, to, to deal with characteristics and for the equation of that sort there are two families of characteristics that in the simple case of epsilon and mu constant define two Dalham classical D'Alembert solutions, two families of D'Alembert waves. Assume that once epsilon and mu, epsilon and mu are variable, then we also, if epsilon and mu are variable in space and time, we also have to deal with two families of waves, two families of waves and two families of characteristics. And one of these characteristics don't intersect belonging to the, to the same family. One of the characteristics that belong to the same family don't intersect in space time. Then we say that we deal with dynamic material that is regular. If this intersection becomes possible, uh, then we will say that the characteristics of the same fa family are irregular and we will call this material irregular. Let us begin with a series of examples illustrating both regular and irregular uh, types of dynamic materials. To this end, we go to this set of slides. This is the de definition of regular and irregular materials. No collision of characteristics in the regular case and some collision of characteristics in the regular case. And then we give a brief analysis of the Snell's law um, related to different uh, relations, uh, different performance of characteristics as they come into intersection 
with the interfaces that separate one material from another. The difference in material, materials will be assumed to be the difference in wave velocity alone. We will consider the case when the wave impedance is the same for both materials, for both materials. Uh, let us go to this example. Mm. Let's go to this example. Assume that this is a temporal axis and this is the spatial axis. Assume that the temporal axis is oriented that way and from left material, material one, the wave is arriving at the interface with velocity, phase velocity V1. And uh, after it hits the interface, there appears to be one secondary wave that keeps propagating through material two. I'm saying one secondary wave because the second secondary wave that could go back to material one is absent due to the identity of wave impedances. So this is a very elementary example, very elementary example. And now let's go to just a second. Let's go to Oh, that is better, that's better. So this is the example I just discussed. This is the interface between two uh, materials. Here is the incident wave that comes from material two. And there are two secondary waves. That is this one and that one that appear after it reaches the interface. All right, so this is a very convenient, very familiar Snell's law, very familiar with Snell's law. Now assume that the interface is brought to motion with respect to immovable materials here. Then that means that this uh, interrupted vertical is brought to slight deviation from its vertical position. It takes this shape. Nothing that is dramatic happened happens if this uh, uh, new position of the interface doesn't reach either of these uh, arrows. Nothing happens, nothing dramatic. There will be two reflected waves as before, this one and that one. I am afraid to say that this one should deviate from this one uh, more uh, illustratively. Excuse me. Um, now, assume that we keep rotating this uh, interface. In other words, we move interface at a, a higher velocity. Then, then, as this interface comes into contact, becomes parallel to the first arrow of the set of arrows that pertain to be there because the materials are not in, not in motion. After that, we arrive at a different picture with respect to the secondary waves. We have one incident wave and have only one secondary wave that is outgoing this is one outgoing wave. Other two waves are ongoing. Here we have two secondary waves, both outgoing. Here we have only one outgoing wave. If we keep rotating that further on in counterclockwise clockwise direction, then we at the end of this rotation arrive at the horizontal position of the interface and here again, we see that we have two outgoing waves, two outgoing waves. 
that means that this product, this problem and that problem are well posed because along the interface, once we consider uh, traditional uh, wave propagation through the interface, we need to get set, to satisfy two boundary conditions. And to this end, we have to deal with two outgoing waves, waves, which is the case here and there, all right? But here is a, a different situation in which we cannot satisfy two conditions as we have only one arbitrary constant related to the single outgoing wave. A similar condition will appear as we rotate this interface in opposite direction. And as we do that in opposite direction, we arrive at the, at the situation in which we may have three outgoing waves. Here we go, three outgoing waves. And once we have three waves, we don't have a possibility to satisfy the um, compatibility conditions uniquely. It makes, um, it allows for the failure of uniqueness of solution. So we are not going to consider these cases and are going to discuss only regular case in which we have two outgoing waves, two outgoing waves. All right, now, um, here we have examples of uh, material geometries, material geometries uh, composed of two um, materials different in their wave velocities only. Here we have what we call spatial lamination, we will see materials occupying layers. Spatial means that along those laminations, there is no dependence of the material properties on time. And uh, here we have another extreme case, the so-called temporal laminates, in which we have no dependence of material concepts, concepts on space they are uniform space-wise. And here we have the intermediate case when it is dependent both upon space and time. Now, when it comes to laminations, we can apply standard homogenization, the main topic of this meeting. We can apply that very nicely and directly. And we'll arrive here at this set of effective waves that are uh, um, um, experiencing um, um, effective um, um, dialectic constant and, ex and effective uh, um, magnetic permeability, effective magnetic permeability. And also the same uh, procedure, similar procedure can be applied to temporal lamination, to temporal lamination. We can also apply um, homogenization to general lamination in which we have to go to new coordinate frame that is uh, related to this uh, general tilted um, uh, laminates. And in all three cases, we we'll arrive at the sets of uh, effective properties. But once in these two cases, the effective properties that define a uh, wave equation with uh, constant coefficients will give birth to d'Alembert waves propagating along um, propagating in both cases with the same effective velocities. In other words, the picture of characteristics for this laminate 
and that laminate will be symmetric with respect to space and temporal axis. In this case, it may fail to be symmetric. In other words, it may happen that for certain types, for certain ranges of parameters, the effective waves will propagate in the same direction with respect to a laboratory observer. And here we have the situation in which this effective characteristic shows the same direction from left to right, whereas here we apply a different uh, uh, construction of uh, lamination that is oriented that way and effective waves propagate in, in different direction, but the speed of propagation here is not the same as speed of propagation here. But what is the same between these speeds is the direction in which the waves propagate. So let us call this composite temporal, spatial temporal composite, let's all call it right composite because the waves, waves are propagating here, effective waves are propagating from left to right. We can arrange the opposite direction composite, the left composite in which waves are propagating the opposite direction. And that means that the space here in this gray part of space temporal plane will be free from disturbances. In other words, as we apply this combination of materials in the uh, DE setup, we'll be able to screen certain domain, a considerable domain in space time from the invasion of uh, not desired characteristics, as undesired characteristics. Now, Let's go back to this case and say a few words about the ener energy transformation in the case of uh, um, spatial and temporal laminates in the first place and um, in the case of general laminate. The main, um, the most signif significant is the couple of these cases, this one and that. Once we have spatial laminate and consider the case when the uh, wave impedances of uh, constituents are the same, then the energy of the wave that propagates in this direction through this construction, that is with the wave vector showing this direction, this set of energy will appear to be time-wise, point-wise, constant in time. In other words, the total energy at this instant of time will be the same as the energy observed at this instant of time. So the energy will be um, uh, constant point-wise in time. Assume now that we deal with the temporal laminate. In this case, the situation is different. Particularly, if the wave impedance for both con constituents is the same as before, in the temporal case, each wave proceeds through one material and goes to another material and, kept and enters back the first material and again goes to the second material and so on. And once it... Uh, goes from material one to material two, then its energy at the moment of temporal switch, here's the moment of temporal switch, the energy of this wave changes by the factor defined as V2 divide, divided by V1. In other words, if the wave goes through the blue materials two times faster than through the white material, then the energy of the wave passing through, this, uh, uh, through the first material before switch uh, will become 
the uh, uh, the, the energy uh, in the af in, in the energy after switch will be v2 be divided by v1 larger than the energy before switch again if we continue following this wave and allow it to go back to material one then the energy is change in the inverse proportion. That means that once we consider the periodic array of those materials, then the average energy through the period will be zero. So the energy will be constant only in average. Here is it constant point-wise, where here is it constant, is it constant in average. So now assume that we wish to Consider the, the geometry, material geometry in space time that is capable to accumulate energy. We see that neither the spatial, in, uh, spatial uh, lamination nor, for, nor temporal lamination will be able to uh, accumulate energy, because in the first case, the energy is preserved uh, time uh, piecewise at each time is the same as at any other time. And in the second example, it's preserved in average. So in none of those examples, the average, the energy is accumulated. And now let's try to find out the way to accumulate the energy to build the material property uh, geometry that is able to calculate, to, calc uh, to um, um, accumulate energy, to accumulate energy, never lose energy. To this end, let us go to this picture. Assume that our original wave propagates through the slow material and assume that the phase velocity through the solar material is such that this wave comes into intersection with the horizontal line, which is the instant of temporal switch from the first material to second material. If the second material is fast, if the wave velocity of the second material is larger than this one, then the energy after this G point will be larger than the energy before its point by the factor V2 divide, uh, divided by V1. Assume that this material is two times faster than that. Then the energy will be doubled after the travel across the temporal transient. Now assume that after the transient, the phase velocity of the uh, wave in the fast material will be such that it comes into intersection with the slow material, but the intersection occurs not at the temporal switch, but at, this, uh, at the spatial transient. At the spatial transient, the energy remains continuous. In other words, the energy will never change as we go from here to here. And now we again find ourselves, our way, better to say, that carries double energy compared to this energy at the bottom of this next temporal transient to faster uh, uh, material. And after this transient, it this receives additional portion of energy. It is doubled again. In other words, the energy here and energy there appear to be in the uh, connection that says that energy here is four times larger than here. And now as we repeat this construction, this shape of the wave root of our wave, then uh, we will be able to consider a bunch of those characteristics that go one parallel to another. And this bunch will carry energy that will be 
never will never lose energy because it will never enter the slow material from the fast material through this temporal uh, transient. It will never enter slow material through this transient. It will enter slow material only through special transient, which is of no harm towards accumulation of energy. So we see now. Hello? Professor yes. Lugin? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, how long it will take? How many minutes time is? Yes, I'm going to uh, finish in a couple of minutes. Okay, sure, thank you. But to finish in a couple of minutes. I have no time to consider all of those examples. But what is important is that finally, we allow at this remarkable picture that illustrates the energy accumulation. We here have the slow material in white and the fast material in blue. No, the fast material in white and the slow material in blue. And look, here we go fast through a white material. And here we enter the slow material through the spatial interface at which no material, uh, no energy is lost. We keep going through slow material until we enter the fast material again, at which point the energy is increasing. And now we go from uh, fast material to slow again at through spatial interface at which material remains the same. It is not lost. And then we continue this procedure further on. So finally, we arrive at the bunch of waves that will progressively, according to kinematics, they will progressively approach one selected wave root of this bunch of wave roots that appear in this particular material um, uh, layout. And this limit appears to be approaching to one single wave root. And we may say that in the, uh, in the limit, asymptotically, it will carry infinite amount of energy if we have one, if we have limited, unlimited amount of energy in this at disposal of the agent that pumps energy into the traveling wave. This periodic line is known to be mapped on the torus as topological equivalent of this periodic line in two, in double periodic material geometry picture. And we see an example of uh, this um, uh, 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 closed line as a picture, as a, as the um, mapping of the periodic trajectory here. So we have the way towards finding the procedure, the micro geometry, not necessarily micro geometry actually, the material geometry that is capable to accumulate energy, to accumulate energy. Now, if the stock of energy at our disposal originally is limited, then at the point where the energy stock is exhausted, we will no longer able to implement the horizontal lines here because the horizontal lines mean the temporal interface, the point at which energy is pumped. But we, as we have no source of energy anymore, then there will be no effectively acting horizontal transients. And the wave will remain propagating through the temporal uh, laminations only, through the temporal laminates with no horizontal transients. In other words, instead of this rectangular domain, which is a checkerboard geometry, we will have from that moment on 
simple uh, micro simple geometry of simple laminates, simple uh, spatial laminates. So here is almost what I wish to say, but due to the lack of time, I'll probably stop at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, your... Professor Dury, for your very yes. energetic and uh, beautiful presentation. And uh, any questions? If anybody has questions, can type it in the chat box. I don't see any questions so far. So we thank once again Professor Luri for the excellent uh, presentation. Thank you, Professor Luri, once again. Thank you.